It's been a long time. Come closer, my child. My old eyes aren't what they once were. Thank you so much, one and all, for your patience. Hope you uh, hope you weren't jonesing too much over the last week. And thank you so much all for coming back and joining on to the first post-Adepticon Morian Glory live stream. I guarantee you it's going to be an ugly stream. A bug stream. A stream hostile to casual play as we know it. And I also guarantee you that the stream will degenerate soon i actually got off the players like yeah I'll, I'll be able to stream tonight got home and i'll just rest my eyes on the sofa for a minute I was like <laughs> those that want to know uh the data comes from meta monday uh, now meta monday po jcms who is the user that does it as you can see up here jcms 85 he um goes through all the bcp stuff and he puts a little summary of of everything on on the competitive subreddit and then he has a website with the the detailed data on it as well um and he has a patreon and i fully encourage all of you to check out his patreon and if you like this kind of meta data uh then please consider going over and signing up because i wouldn't be able to do my content without him and uh, our insights into the data and our ability to like challenge what gw like tells us uh wouldn't be possible uh without him so he deserves all of our support if you can support on patreon he's definitely someone you should consider uh, supporting because he's a big big part of the community let us now start with the data coming in bottom place to absolutely no one's surprise we have death watch frankly death watch are non-entity at this point last over the last few weeks I have said that they were a dead faction. I no longer believe that you can even say that. They're a non-entity. In a weekend where there were nearly 1,000 competitive players, Deathwatch had five of them. That is... That is insane. And those, those numbers just aren't changing. And what's crazy about these numbers is normally when you have a faction like this, when you have a faction that has got very limited uh, numbers, what you often see is them weirdly doing very well because there's so few of them that all it takes is one person to go to his local GT uh, and like just go like four and one and the faction's win rate suddenly like jumps up. You know, like it, 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 it goes because there's like only one. Like we've had this happen where like there were like two people playing Yanari in the whole, like a thousand people would play in a weekend. Two people would play Yanari and they both go three and two and suddenly they'd be like near the top of the lead, leaderboard, like the top five. But they're not, you know, because there's only two of them and they're just playing in the local area kind of thing. So, so Death Watch, were, Death Watch are not a dead faction. Death Watch are a non entity. They're quite a niche faction. Um, they're not heavily pushed by GW. Uh, they have some amazing models, but they've not really been part of like the prime. They've not really had a huge amount of Primaris love, um, and they they haven't got. They've got like they haven't got a huge. They've never they've never had a huge competitive following. What you tend to find is that. Um, People jump once every edition. Death Watch become hyper meta. Who here remembers Storm Shields and Storm Bolters, right, guys? So once every edition, everyone dusts off their Death Watch armies, and suddenly they shoot up to like top of the game. This kind of happened early on in tenth edition when their 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 ammunition was affecting uh, all of their weapons, their special issue ammunition. Um, and then when Death Watch is shit, everyone basically puts them back on the shelves. Well, my have. Is that Death Watch are really cool. It is sad to see them down here. GW really needs to give them some love. And I hope that they will get it with their codex. The, the draw to them is every model feels like a unique veteran from a different chapter. And that doesn't translate onto the tabletop. So someone goes, oh, I can't wait to have like an ultramarine armed with like a bolter and a crimson fist guy with a power fist. 
and then they get there and they're like all of those all of the weapons mean the same thing all of your special you know all, all of your range weapons are the same all of your special all of your combat weapons are the same yeah so now it doesn't matter what shoulder pads you have it doesn't matter trying to build individual backstories around you guys that doesn't feel the feel isn't there so yeah, Death Watch are a, a really good example of why you need to have granular options because they're a faction that thrives in individuality. And right now, they're as individual as porridge made with water and salt. That's how that's how fucking flavorful they are right now. These have got in a really weird place. Really weird place right now. I got to play them uh, round four at Depticon in the singles. And for the first two turns, it was a nightmare. My uh, every single time I killed one of my opponent's units, even if it was an elite unit, he just got it back. And it was like I was. It was like no matter what I did, they just they were come coming out the walls, man. They're coming out the goddamn walls. And, it's, and then he just rolled ones and twos to bring his units back. As entire army collapsed. If the units had continued to come back, it would have been a fucking good game. Would have been a damn close game. Would have made the game interesting. I was on the ropes. I like being on the ropes. I like tough games. I like games that could go either way. The first two turns, it was anybody's game. And then after that, it was... Like shooting fish in a barrel. Jeans de la Court right now, uh, it's too swingy. The first two turns of that game, both me and my opponent were having the greatest time. It's like, is it going to come back? And we'd be like, whoa, you know, do like a drum roll. Whoa, hey, you know, and I was cheering my opponent. I was like, come on, man, you can do this. You can get it on. Because, you know, it's, it was, you know, he was taking huge casualties, but the fact they kept coming back was huge. And then the moment that they stopped coming back, we both he stopped enjoying the game and I stopped enjoying the game. I, as opponent, stopped enjoying it. The GSC, the problem is they're so swingy. And the moment that, that the moment they don't get units back, they don't feel they don't feel fun. And it just feels bad for everyone. Uh the win rate isn't so bad. Uh that win rate literally represents those people that can roll four pluses. If you can roll a four plus, you'll do okay. If you can't roll a four plus, you won't do okay. The funny thing is that actually probably is perfectly representative because it's like, you know, not all of your units are battle line, right? So a lot of sixty, you know, a lot of your units only come back a third of the time, and that's and some of them come back half the time, and that probably balances out to about forty percent of the time your units come back. <laughs> but it is not surprising to me in any way, shape, or form that these guys. Are in a bad place. Uh, you're basically paying points as if your units do come back. GW really fucked up with the last Genius of the Cult uh, update because they should have made the units harder to come back, but then made them cheaper. All they did is make the units not come back. And paying eight points for a near fight is frankly fucking laughable. Speaking of Xenos Abominations, though, we have Tyranids. So Tyranid player numbers are holding steady. Uh, it's not surprising that we're seeing Tyranids come in with relatively high numbers or decent numbers of players every week. They were, after all, they are fundamentally a popular faction. And secondly, they also uh, were in the starter box. So Tyranid numbers being reasonably high is, is to be expected. Now, Tyranids have been hovering around 41, 42, 43% win rates for months now. Pre-balance patch, post-balance patch, they've been hovering around the 40% win rate. And so you, at a glance, you would stare at this data and go, yeah, bugs, same shit, different week. But it's not, because every week, the real story is told down here. And this is what fluctuates all the fucking time. In some ways, we're seeing similar patterns. Majority of people are going invasion fleet because it gives you good tactical flexibility. But this week was a real hammering for invasion fleet with only a 38% win rate. That's rough. They still managed to win 44 games, and one person uh, did did manage to go like four and one or you know, near near as damn it. 
But the majority of people really struggled because they only won 44 out of 115 games. It's only a 38% win rate. You, that would make you think it's a, it's a terrible attachment. Then we saw some spikes in things like Synaptic Nexus. I've started hearing a lot of chit and dare I say chat around this attachment. Apparently they've got like, I don't know if it's the right, it's not called this, but they've got Armor of Contempt in Synaptic Nexus. I could be wrong there. Um... So yeah, Synaptic Nexus is seeing some play is, is interesting. It has clearly it hasn't played off played out yet. Vanguard Onslaught continues to uh, uh to rear its ugly head uh with five players. That's because a lot of people are still uh with Vanguard Onslaught, you're able to score a lot of points, but the problem is that it relies upon you being very sneaky. You try and be sneaky against world eaters, you're just gonna get your shit pushed in 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 your ass and out your fucking mouth, basically. A really big story here and the one to watch is unending swarm i play a little bit of nids i really enjoy my turns it's one of the army it's one of the armies that i say if you're a guard player and you need a bit of a palette cleanse but you don't want to go out and play a whole new game since the night bot actually you want to stay in 40k and you want an army that you're going to find very comfortable to play and very fun to play Tyranids is the way forward because Tyranids, is in many ways they're kind of like xenos guard you've got big bugs that do the damage little bugs that swarm and do objectives right they're very similar the difference is that guard tend to be quite a defensive faction like you sort of move up to a point and then you hold it whereas Tyranids are like nah, they just go at you all gas no breaks i've been playing with Tyranids, and naturally as someone who likes pure infantry guard i gravitated towards a, a, a horde a swarm list and so i actually have 200 40 termagants i can only use 120 of them but i have 240 of them and i also have about 120 Hormagons as well. I've used that army multiple times now. The Unending Swarm. I've used it as pure swarm. I've used it as hybrid. And I've loved it. And it's felt really powerful. And it's felt really fast. And it's felt damn good at scoring. And there's been a lot of people saying for a while now that Unending Swarm is, is good. People are just... People are kind of sleeping on it. We still see people gravitate towards Invasion Fleet, and I think that's because it's the safe option. This is 40k, baby. Safe doesn't mean you're going to win. Often winning requires you going balls to the fucking wall. And I feel like Unending Swarm lets you do that. And so this is, for me, the most interesting part of the turn in data, and definitely the area that I, I want to watch. Maybe next week, Unending Swarm will be fucking down again. Who knows? And I, for one... I'm very excited for it because I've got a big old turn in swarm that's ready to hit the table. <laughs> All right. Fourth and bottom, we have Space Marines. Space Marines certainly seem to be settling in here, but they've got some damn good uh, player numbers. 61 people running Space Marines and fundamentally 121 games won. Uh, sure, that was only that was out of 293, which meant there's only a 41% win rate. But you had um, three players who were able to go uh, the distance, with one in the Vanguard Spearhead managing to get uh, to go four and one, and two in the Ironstorm Spearhead who also managed to go four and one. Uh, it's interesting to see the, the spread on the fact on the numbers as well. Like Vanguard has 16 players, Gladius had 13 players. And Iron Storm had uh, 90 players. You've got some out. You've got some randoms here, like Assault Force and Stormlands and Anvil. But uh, if we look at the main ones, you know, Vanguard had good player numbers that was able to achieve 51%. Gladius had good player numbers that were able to achieve 45%. Iron Storm had uh, good player numbers that was surprisingly only got 40%. I feel like Iron Storm is probably suffering from a lot of people jumping on it and people figuring it out. Uh, also, maybe it's maybe suffering a little bit from the fact that um, people expect to face Firestorm, so they've got more experience on how to how to face it. Uh, but if you look at all of the, if you look at it, this this 41% I would say is being artificially deflated. Because if you look at this, you've got 51% here, big numbers, big players, 45%, and then 40%. Now, on our, that, if you actually take those, if you just, if you cut out all the factions that are really, all the, if you cut out the shitty ones, are the outliers, like the 22% here, and the 27% here, and just, and look at the three, what are acknowledged as the three best ones, uh, Marines have actually got a 45% win rate. So Marines are not in a bad place at all. They've just got a number of extra detachments which people keep trying out 
which is which is causing the overall win rate to fall. But by and large, it's not a marine problem. It's a detachment problem. Some are just better than others. The Arcadios came out swinging and they've kind of settled down. But again, this, this number is really, really deceptive. 30 players is good. 56 wins out of 132 games. 56 raw wins is a very respectable amount. Four people. Four people were able to go the distance and go four and one. Out of those four, every single one of them went Iron Storm Spearhead. Iron Storm Spearhead Dark Angels had the most players. Over half their players this week were playing that. And they achieved a 56% win rate. And on average, they have a 48% win rate. That's real high. And then you look at everything else, and it's like 29% win rate, 27% win rate, 20% win rate, 20% win rate, 33% win rate. And it's all like ones and twos. Dark Angels are just better. Ice Wolf Spearhead is the best attachment, and Dark Angels clearly leverage that incredibly well. Uh, Dark Angels on a 56 58% win rate. They strong. They real strong. They one dimensional, but they real strong. And that's the one that got to fight alongside a Dark Angels Iron Storm Spearhead in the uh, team tournament at Adepticon. I've seen firsthand, they strong. They real strong. They basically, the problem is though, that this isn't Dark Angels. I mean, technically it is. If you are a Dark Angels player, it's totally possible for you to leverage Iron Storm and, and, and go and smash it. If you want to have a bit of variety, Dark Angels, if you want to feel like you're playing Deathwing or Ravenwing or just classic fucking Greenwing, you can't do that. You're just playing green space marines. That's it. Competitively, Dark Angels are in a very, very good spot, but scratch below the surface and you are seeing a lot of disquiet in that community and understandably so. But again, we're just being meta and cutthroat and fuck the law and fuck all that stuff. Um, Dark Angels have got some real good options. So it's... What do you want from the faction? Do you want to win? Or do you want to play Dark Angels? As Dark Angels should be. Chaos are in a funny place right now. 25 players shows decent, decent numbers. Okay, that's not bad. 56 wins out of 130... Means that the you know you know on average out of twenty five players, on average each player like won more than two games. Went to an RTT, it went went to a GT and went like two and three. That's a result you can come away and hold hold your head up high from. But only and one of those players even managed to go like four and one. It feels like think about if you go back to the beginning of ten, think about for how long space from players there was like loads care space from players. There was like 40, 50 people every week and they had a low win rate, low win because they were just like they were like they were just play testing and play testing and play testing and finally they honed in on what worked and it was glorious praise be to the dark gods and they got taken away from them and it almost feels like the community burnt themselves out they put so much effort into unlocking that s tier combo uh and perfecting it and honing it and then when it's now they've had that taken away the desire or the motivation uh, or the willingness to start trying other bits out doesn't seem to be there. And instead, a lot of people seem to have you know, moved on or have kind of just continued doing what they're doing and accepting that it's not quite as good as it once was. But yeah, Chaos Space Marines aren't in a bad spot. They're just in limbo. I've seen it done by other people as well. I've picked up Pretty much the entire, if not all, most of, if not all, of the Abaddon Giga Blob of Doom in one turn. Because it's they're just three wounds. Think of how much flat damage three are in, is in like guard tanks. It it's really, it's kind of tough, because you used to you know if it can kill a tank, it can kill a Terminator, and there aren't that many Terminators, so you don't need that many shots. It's not a bad combo. But it really does feel like it's a trap. It hasn't got any damage output. It's not that hard to kill. It's phenomenally expensive. 
and the movement five. So short and the movement five, and it's not that difficult to like, you know, after a turn or two, slow him down with like a basilisk. Maybe I'm wrong. I just, I'm not, I really feel like the Abaddon Blob is hugely outdated at this point. Bill Knights are just doing their thing. I have yet to play them since the balanced data slate. So they are a little bit of a blind spot. But they have 30, 37 players is, is, is good numbers. Two people going four and one. So they can't quite win a tournament, but they can get like most of the way. Uh, and a 45% win rate seems real good. The only thing that I know about Imperial Knights is whenever I see them across the gaming hall, they seem to be more of the big ones. It doesn't seem to be exclusively Baby Knight spam anymore. But uh, I'm not uh, having not faced Imperial Knights since the update, I'm not sure what they're doing differently. My instinct is Knights be knighting. If you've got enough anti tank to kill them, you're fine. If you don't, you're fucked. That's why they're close, to, always close to 50%. There may be more to it, so when I do get a chance to face them, hopefully that'll give me some more insights into, into the faction. Death Guard! My, my, my. Fucking love Death Guard. <laughs> Death Guard are strong. I'm seeing a lot of numbers reflect that. I've got 54 players. That's almost as many as fucking Space Marines, man. 127 raw wins is definitely something that that faction can brag about. 274... Uh, games played six or uh, more than 10 percent of their players went four and one and one of their players actually won a tournament this uh week which gives them a bang on this weekend uh they're on 40 they're, they're basically on on average they were 46 percent this week uh 47 average now if we have a little look up what tournament did they win uh there you go so they won a 26 player gt uh in in germany now uh 26 players you know pretty small but it's still look it's still five rounds it's still a gt um and i, I kind of feel like that's why death guard are you know we're seeing them in the bigger events going four and one consistently you know like we're getting up to 54 players now that's a proper gt right there you know we're seeing them poke their smelly heads up we're getting to the top four of a 156 player super major you know look death guard are, are really and uh, look four and one here is this a manchester gt my god look at that Two, that's a, that's a super 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 major um so death guard are in a really really good spot right now so death guard are doing really really well but my and but my but my they started doing a lot better when they started taking plague marines in rhinos it's interesting that most Plague Green armies, most Death Guard armies have settled on like, oh, I'll take like two Rhinos of it. Well, if that's the thing that's given you a huge shot in the arm, why not spam it? See what fucking happens. Berserker Warband, 41 players. That's very healthy. Very healthy numbers. 87 wins. I have 184 games played. Six people going 4-1, and one, but no one managing to win a tournament. 47% win rate in line with a 45% average. So world ears haven't changed all that much. Um, it's basically put Angron at the top of your list, and then whatever you kind of whatever you really want after that. Uh, I actually have continued to face um, a lot of eight bound. Uh, eight bound are fanta fantastically killy, but now they can't go in transports. I found I, I found they're phenomenally susceptible to being slowed down by things like basilisks. Um, in one of my doubles games, I had a unit of eight bound. I hit them with a the basilisk. I didn't kill any of them. But because they then had two inch less movement, and then they only got a two on their advance, and then they uh, had mass two to their charge, they basically missed out on six inches of movement, which meant what should have been like a four inch charge was a 10 inch charge, which they failed. And that basically meant let the next turn they're out of position and I blew them off the table. Yeah, so, uh, so World Eaters, the one evolution to their, their meta is Lord of Skulls. So when you're facing off against them, it's not just Angry Ron you've got to kill. Also got to kill the Lord of Skulls. And if you don't kill the Lord of Skulls, Angron's coming back. If you want to win a tournament with them, you need to know what the fuck you're doing. But if you just want to do well with them, you can kind of just 
muddle your way through it and just brute force your way to three and two, four and one. You won't go five and oh, unless you know what you're doing, but just acting like a world eater and go and just attacking everything, you'll, you'll get a positive win ratio. So yeah, uh, world eaters just doing what world eaters do. Orcs seeing a little bit of a recovery this time around. Uh, 32 players, seven, but that is surprising. We're, we're seeing a little bit of a dip in, in their player numbers. And when you've got armies like Death Guard and World Eaters outnumbering venerable factions like Orcs, you're definitely seeing a little bit of a an issue there. Uh, 70 wins is, is still respectable. I have 148 games played. Four Orc players going 4-1, but no one able to win, a, win an event. 47% win rate, uh, kind of in line with their 45% win rate. So I still see people taking Mozrog and and a, and, a, and a Beast Boss. That seems to be an auto include every time. The evolution I've seen in Orc players list seems to be more around. Uh, I've seen people taking more things like uh, Mega Nobs. I've seen more, uh, you know, rather than you know, sort of just relying on like knobs, and seeing more people taking. I saw seems to be people taking a lot of, like taking battle wagons and stuff. And I've seen people like spamming like the big squigoths, which are kind of crazy. I think all players are beginning to enter, are doing what they need to do. And they're starting to experiment a little bit with their lists. And that's very important because as a whole, the meta got very, very used to fighting essentially the same orc build over and over and over again. Uh, and it meant that we were very easily able to predict what the orcs were going to do. Now that we're seeing different tougher transports turn up and we're seeing different tougher kinds of elite infantry um, and we're starting to see people uh, move away from the same shit in every army. Uh, it's, starting, it's starting to become a little bit uh, more interesting to face against Orcs. However, there's still some some things that won't go away, like Flash Gits and Bad Rook. Um, I'm just not convinced by that combo. So yeah, Orcs are starting to experiment a bit more. And we're starting to see a mixture of lists, but there's still a few staples that they're relying upon, like Mozrog, Flash Gits, Bad Rook, Beast Boss. We'll see if um, we will see if we see some further evolution in the Orc meta. This week, there were 31 players that played Drakari. That's good. Every single one of them took the new detachment. <laughs> no one took the OG index attachment. Everyone went Sky Splinter Assault. This goes to show that Drakari, that the Drakari attachment was the problem and that the data sheets and stuff that they had were actually fine. Really, really strong. And uh, and Drakari just feel fine now. I don't think GW needs to alter anything about them. They're fast, but they're fragile. They're unbelievably killy, but if uh, but they require a high level of skill to play. Bukhari feel like Dark Elder. And they feel like they should do. Fast and furious. Last week, or well, last time I did Meta Monday, I said that Grey Knights um, were just doing what they were doing. Up and down, up and down, up and down. I now have more insights into Grey Knights. Yes, they are very much uppy downy. Very, very much so. However, they now have got a key update which has explained why are Grey Knights doing, uh, why are suddenly Grey Knights settling in and seeming like not only are they, um, they're still doing well. Dread Knights. My God, Dread Knights. If you played Grey Knights, in 5th and 6th edition, you're going to be very, very happy if, <laughs> that your investment in Dread Knights has continued to pay off uh, five editions later. <laughs> Having those uh, units become more viable has really been a big shot in the arm for the faction. No longer are they relying upon the enemy not being able to screen them out. No longer are they just relying upon um, people being un inexperienced against their shenanigans. Uh, they now have the ability to actually do some damage. Now, don't get it twisted. A Dread Knight is not going to win a firefight with a Lehman Russ. But they actually have some punch now. 
It's not a lot of punch, but they've got some punch. And so now you've got a faction which is hyper mobile, has the potential for lots of MSU, and has a, a lot more durability because Red Knights are vehicles in the, the day, but also can actually do some damage. They're not trying to storm bolt to bloody land raiders to death anymore. They actually have big ass swords, big ass hammers, and they've got side cannons, all sorts of things. So yeah, definitely had a big, big insight into Grey Knights and their Dread Knights at Adepticon. Um, the fact that I played with Salty Simon in two doubles games and his list was a thousand points for Dread Knights and Unit Terminators. And his list would have just been five Dread Knights if he owned a fifth Dread Knight because that Unit Terminator didn't really do anything. Dread Knight spam is real and it can hurt you. I expect to face four to six Dread Knights in most competitive Grey Knight lists going forward. They are back and they are back hard. The saga of the Admech continues. They only had 10 players this, this uh, week, which is, you know, a bit of a resurgence for them. It's double digits, but remember, generally everyone was playing a bit more, because it's nine, apart from Death Watch, there's 978 players, almost 1,000 players. Uh, they had a 48% win rate, and they had, uh, they had 10 players with 25 um, uh, wins with 52 uh, out of 52 games. Uh, and one of those players, three players going 4-1, and one, and one of those players actually managing to go uh, win an event. Now, if you look at this, you've got, uh, basically, it's this Qatari Hunter cohort, okay? Uh, you've also, oh, you've got this one guy, sorry, this one guy who won all five of his games and won an event. Okay, so he, so that is definitely pumping the numbers up a little bit. So if you look at this one second, I think someone worked it out. Um, if I just go over here one second. There was some controversy. Apparently the third place Admech player at Talladega is a known tournament cheater. So that's something to be aware of. We'll see if anything comes from that. So there were 10 players, but four of them, six of the players did terribly, and four of the players were the ones that netted 81% of the win rate between them. So 40% of the players won 80% of the games, and it was basically using pure horde. The remaining six players... Using other list styles or even Skatari Hunter cohorts with less horde and sometimes units scrape 26% win rate between themselves. So it looks good on the surface, but the reality is that actually it's the entire faction is being propped up by just a horde. A horde. So basically, Admet look like they're in a good place right now, but actually it's one build and it's prohibitively expensive to collect. Leagues of Votan, Leagues of Cheese, seeing a big resurgence. Uh, why are we seeing a big resurgence of, of Leagues of Votan? Uh, well, firstly, they're quite cheap. And secondly, they play very well into uh, Necrons. They're, they're still, we're still seeing the same units though. Two units of the big wannabe Terminators. Exosuit armor guys. A couple of Sagittars. We're seeing some people take Berserkers, some people not take Berserkers. But it is essentially the same list day in, day out. But surprisingly, unlike Admech, that's not such a big problem for Votan. Why? Because they've got like 12 units to call upon. Chaos Knights. Like with Imperial Knights, a bit of a blind spot for me. I haven't seen, I haven't played against them since the update. It seems like every Chaos Army I come across, whether it's Death Guard or whether it's uh, Chaos Space Marines, every one of their mums is taking two to three brigands. It could be something that, you know, seeing Chaos Space Marine players mech up and take some brigands might be kind of cool. Maybe with Death Guard taking some brigands is kind of cool. But they are fragile. And the issue that I find with them is their guns are relatively short ranged. But yeah, they are they are fast, they are brutal, their melter is good, their political tubeless is good. Brigands are great, but 
I find they're a, they're a, they're a one-hit wonder. They have to get close-ish, but then they're no good in combat. The big question is, uh, how are Chaos Knights doing as a solo faction? Uh, 30 players, healthy numbers. Um, 73 wins out of 149 games. One person going all the way, although not quite well going 4-1, not going to win the tournament. They've settled in at about 49% this week, 48% on average. Um, they're decent. I need to play them to get more understanding of how they work solo. Uh, the last time I played them, I just played like 12 of the baby knights. Uh, 12, 13 baby knights. It would be nice to see if that's still what they're doing or if they're uh, going down a different route. My, my, my. Eldar didn't win any tournaments this week. Ooh, that must be a first, man. <laughs> Baby. I have to admit, I like where Eldar are right now. They're, they are hyper elite. 107 victories out of 218 games played gives them a 49% win rate. Clearly, they're a faction that still have uh, some teeth because they went uh, five of their players went four and one, but no one won a tournament. That probably is a, a, a symptom of the fact that they've been nerfed quite heavily. It's probably a symptom that a lot of the players, like the tournament winning players, have moved on from the faction. So, what this kind of shows is that. If you play Eldar, you're going to have a good time at tournament. You're still going to be able to go sort of 2 and 3, 3 and 2, probably 4 and 1. Um, and you might be able to win some local events with them as well. But they're no longer the scourge of the meta. Now, if you're an Eldar player and you go all in on someone and you don't, and it doesn't work and you bounce, um, you're going to lose a heart. You're going to lose like 3 or 4 units and that's your army crippled. A bit like with Dark Elder, Elder feel exactly where they should be right now. And if you know what you're doing with them, but they're a dying race. And yeah, losing losing whole units should be a big deal for them. Should be a really big deal for them. Can't believe I'm saying this, but I think Eldar are in a, are in a very appropriate spot right now. I like it. What a resurgence. Since the battle, we're seeing, you know, there was a one time when we were seeing very, very low sisters numbers. Now we're seeing, you know, 27, 30, you know, we're seeing 27 of those players that puts them, puts them in line with a lot of fa other factions out there. Um, and they're getting the wins in there. You know, they've got 66 wins out of 133 games. Four players went, uh, went the distance with one of those players going all the way and winning a tournament. They now have six tournament wins to their name post balanced data slate. The 50% win rate on average and a 53% win rate. Sisters are looking good. And a big part of it is that people have kind of worked out that sisters have fate dice that haven't been nerfed. And the big difference between uh, sisters and uh, an Eldar is Eldar got all their fate dice at the beginning and could just mag dump them into you at the beginning of the game. Sisters have to spend two or have to spend about two turns building up the fate dice before they then mag dump them into you. Sisters are really cool. But no, the reason, the reason sisters do quite well is they have a lot of Melter, and Melter uh, counters Necrons quite well. And and Melter is, you know, Melter struggles to kill vehicles, except for when you can go for every unit. You can be like, Miracle Dice, five, you know, if you build up a nice selection of sort of fives and sixes for your Miracle Dice, and you've got ways of influencing that so it's possible, you can be like, ah, I'm going to shoot with the Melter, got the hit, just going to make sure I win with that five. Boom. So Black Templars coming in with... Uh, I think they are... Oh, not quite. They're, they're doing very well. Black Templars, one of the best... Black Templars are consistently one of the top Space Marine chapters. There are other chapters, which as you can see, have done better this week, like Blood Angels and Space Wolves. But those are kind of outliers. And I wouldn't be surprised if next week there back down i would say black templars right now are the most powerful of um of chapters uh they've got good player numbers 98 wins have 197 games played four players going the distance one player going all the way uh, and winning an event 50 percent win rate very close to their average of 52 percent we get into it we do have a few outliers like firestorm having like a weirdly high win rate for them, that's an outlier. That, that won't be like that next week. Now, interestingly, Righteous Crusaders is the most popular Black Templar um, detachment, and yet 
It actually has the lowest win rate and has consistently had the lowest win rate. New people who, who get into the Black Templars and are like, I'll run right Crusade because that's like the fluffy detachment. I would argue these are the Black Templar players and these are the people who right now are playing Black Templars. And there's a big difference between being a faction player, a faction specialist, a faction enthusiast, and being someone who's just playing a faction at you know for now. Gladius Task Force has been consistently doing okay for the Black Templars, which is, you know, it's got a really high average. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, definitely one to keep an eye on. Uh, but the big one is Iron Storm. Why is Iron Storm doing so well for Black Templars? It's quite simple. Multi-melters. Every Black Templar vehicle or nearest damn it can strap a multi-melter to it. Iron Storm plus Black Templar vehicle, plus tanks, plus the, plus the action multi-melters, plus a bunch of other stuff that... Uh, you know that black templars uh, get that is unique uh, and and feeds into iron storm is very very tasty let me just say there's a lot to get excited about there is a lot of reasons why you should be going from six to midnight and is that a death strike in your pants or are you pleased to see me <laughs> 57 that makes us the fourth most played faction Ah, yeah, baby. I'm 26, 27 factions with a fourth most played. And look at those numbers, boys. 143 wins. Just pure raw numbers. Like 143 games were won. 143 battles were carried by the guard. Out of 283 games played. So 13 players going 4-1. and one. Or even going five, or even going undefeated, but not quite having the points to 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 win a tournament. So we haven't won a tournament this weekend, but that is really really healthy. Fifty one percent winner overall, which is a nice jump over forty six percent. Will we see the guard win rate continue to climb? That's the big question. Um. The guard win rate is going to fluctuate a little bit. I suspect that as more people jump onto the guard and try and see what all the fuss is about, all the hype is about, we may see some people that may see the win rate go right down again. I think the guard win rate is going to do this for a little while before it settles out. The question is, will we will it settle to its true position before an update or, or will it continue to fluctuate up and down? I wouldn't be surprised if the guard win rate settles in at about 53%. I think we'll see that settle in. I'm going to say 53%. Thing with guard is that they are we are really powerful right now. I think guard are one of those armies that uh if you it's they're a little bit like dark elder. You can get some phenomenal results from the guard. And there are some good combos some really strong lists out there right now but you're definitely going to have to get a few games in with them the number of times that i have seen in this edition and in other editions where i've seen people go into a guard go into guard and just be like okay they've picked all the powerful units and yet there's no cohesion they are not simple brute force lists Okay, look at the results that um, David Gaylard has been getting with his guard uh, and has, as his list has been adapting and evolving. There's nothing in there. There's no one aspect he's completely leaning into. He has infantry, he has tanks, he has artillery. And he's got, he's got some close combat in there as well. And a big part of, of his list doing well is the fact that he's he has practiced really, really, really hard with them so they've got fan and he's really leveraging the man the maneuverability of the faction um so if you but if you come in if you copy and paste that list and start using it uh, if you don't appreciate like how you meant to be using those units you're gonna lose hard what will be really interesting to see is um now and, and because of this i don't think they're ever going to reach the same levels as necrons because the big difference, you know, we are skipping ahead a little bit here. The big difference with Necrons is that they're quite straightforward. Because they have units that individually on their own can perform very well. For example, Catan. 
you can shove four katan into your army and kind of just like throw them forward uh you know just use the bases like oh, i'll stick behind a bit of cover here and there um and not just be completely open to all the shooting and you will just as a, even as a relatively inexperienced player be able to copy and paste in that list and go with them i don't think you can do that with guard i'm not saying as as i always say this because i don't see myself as a particularly skilled player some people might be like oh more than you being modest i'm not being modest i'm being truthful i don't see myself as a particularly skilled player is my well-practiced player i'm an experienced player i'm not a particularly skillful player i struggle with micro i i definitely make positioning and deployment mistakes often but um i'm very well practiced they're not i wouldn't describe them as a high skilled army i would describe them as a as a high practice army so long story short i think right now guard have got good data sheets and they have some very good combinations and they have some strong army rules in the form of orders and i think that in the right hands uh or in a in, in a set of highly skilled hands or a set of highly practiced hands you can do a lot with them but i also expect that a lot of people that are going to come over to the guard are going to get a bit of a nasty shock if they expect to walk into this faction and start winning games immediately However, if they persevere with it, they will start winning games with them. So yeah, Garda are definitely in a uh, in a really good position right now. I don't think they need nerfs yet. I would be like, if I was UW, I'd get them loaded, but I wouldn't shoot them off just yet. But speaking of other factions, we have uh, Blood Angels. 30 players, 73 wins, 143 games. Uh, uh, games played six players going four and one with a 51 percent win rate with an average win rate of 46 percent and we are seeing blood angels they are clawing their way back up blood angels i feel through pure blood sweat and tears are regaining some momentum by the spirit of sanguinius they are reclaiming their mantle as one of the best, most badass Space Marine chapters. And it seems to be all coming from Sons of Sanguinius. We are seeing a few outliers like Gladius Task Force this week had a big surge, but that's probably a blip. We have to keep an eye on that before we draw any major conclusions from that. The big one is Sons of Sanguinius. And in many ways, plus two strength is kind of like plus one to wound. If you are strength four if you're strength four blood angel going up to strength five means that you're still wounding pretty much every vehicle in the game on a six because most vehicles are toughness 10 or higher if you go up to strength six then suddenly uh you're wounding most vehicles with your basic chainsaw dudes on fives it's only the heaviest things that you're wounding on sixes so sons of sang i feel like just giving them plus two and it means that also if you're strength six when you're wounding um enemy light infantry you're wounding them on twos which is what blood angels should do they should be able to claw through tanks and butcher light infantry and then everything else should be part of the course but yeah no long story short blood angels are seeing a resurgence and that's good and that and they are seeing a resurgence in a true way, not an Iron Storm spearhead way. It's very good. Tower doing very well right now. Big player numbers. Big wins. And a, four, a lot of players going the distance. That's almost 25% of their players going 4-1. and one. They won two tournaments this weekend including Adepticon, which is one of the super mages. So yeah, Tau are doing very well because they are very maneuverable with good firepower and and lots and lots of of, uh, of units. And as Godlike Poe has put, and the number of Seeker Missiles they're packing is ridiculous. Yep. Will the win rate go up or down with the Codex?
what I've seen from the Codex, and what I've been told about the Codex, is that it's a bit shit. I I I will wait to see. I'll wait before I believe believe that. Um, okay, next up we have the Banana Boys. I want to like them, but I can't. <laughs> I want to like them. I even had an amazing game against them, uh, but they just seem like super. They're, they're they're quite frustrating to play against. My personal prejudice aside, uh, I now understand how they're playing. It's real. Uh, it's real spicy. So when people were telling me that Adeptus Custodes, uh, like infantry heavy lists were winning games i thought that was like that was really i thought that was really interesting because i thought well surely people are just going to start off um on the board and then just march slowly across and get the shit shot out of them that's not what they're doing the meta custodies list will uh basically take a thousand points and put it into deep strike and it's going to rapid ingress two of those units so the the list that I faced off that seemed to be very very uh, very 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 competitive was um, six blobs of infantry, like three wardens, three custodian guard, a uh, couple of sorry, a couple of uh, blade champions, and then like Trajan and maybe something else was knocking around there as well. Um, and then there was a couple of cheap units of sister silence, certain objectives. And a couple of the big the big tanks with the blaze cannons. Um, and what this army did is pick fixed secondaries. Basically, um, against me because I was running Met Guard, it was bring it down and um, deploy teleport homers. But I imagine if they were facing any other army, they'd probably just they'd probably just pick cleanse and deploy teleport homers or something like that. And basically, what the what the army does is the um, the stuff that starts off on the board just marches into the middle and just hides there. And what my opponent did is he had a Calidus Assassin, which sat in the middle of the board and uh, deployed teleporter homers every turn because it's lone op. And next was Calidus Assassin, uh, or surrounding it, he had a unit of of, of wardens. Who are, um, who are obviously very, very durable. Um, so you can't... The Caladus is doing lone op. You can't stop her from doing lone op. And if you to get to her, you have to fight through one of the toughest units in the game, which is a unit of, uh, of Wardens. And they don't need to move. And so that's 15 victory points in the bank. And honestly, that's... Prob that, that's probably 15 primary in the bank as well. And those wardens can happily, if they've not if they've not got to kill anything, those wardens can happily not only protect their cardus, but also cleanse that objective. And then you can basically do the same on the other side. And so what you do is you have a, you have like half of your custodian's infantry just sitting in the middle of the board doing fixed objectives. And the opponent can't really stop them from doing fixed objectives. And the reason they can't really stop them is because uh, line side blocking terrain is going to make it so uh, so you've got to try and root them out via combat. Um, or you have to get close, at which point the warders go and, and jump on you. Yes, Kastashi, you're right. Draxus is in there as well doing uh, double shooting. Yeah, which is crazy wrong. Yeah. Uh, that was in my in this, this list that I faced as well. So, but the reason why... So, reason, so you've got the terrain on their side... The other thing that's causing you issues is the that's just what half the list is doing. The other half is rapid ingressing. Rapid ingress turn one, rapid ingress turn two, and it's putting under you putting you under a huge amount of pressure because rapid ingress is behind some lines like blocking terrain, and then it comes and gets you. And the next turn it comes and get you. They're, they're, wherever you advance, they're slamming one of these roadblocks into you. And so basically the custodies spend a thousand points of just pressurizing you and then they um and then they have the other half of their list just doing their objectives but just to be clear they have a very viable tactic and it's very powerful and you can see a lot of people are running it 
and it is yielding some really, really strong results. I just worry that it's quite boring. It probably feels great as the Custodes player to be like, yes, my plan is working. But on the other side of the table, it's very uninteractive. And so we interested to see if the Depths of Custodes and this uninteractive tactic survives the next balance patch. Be interesting to see there. Now, Chaos Demons have been doing well for a while now. They've been going in the right direction. And uh, it's no surprise. Two, so the, they had 19 players with 52 wins out of 95 games played. Four of their players went uh, X and 1, but none of them won a tournament. They had a 55% win rate this week, which is uh, quite high above their 50%. But what's interesting is they didn't have any tournament wins. So they can, they can win games. They don't seem to be able to go the distance. Three things have allowed Demons to start doing well. Firstly, they got big points decreases. The big points decreases allowed them to take monster, all the monsters they wanted. But they finally had enough units to reliably hold objectives. The issue with Demon Monster Mash before the last points decrease was they had the monsters but they had like at best like three or four token units for objectives and they were very easy to take out and then it forced the demons to not the big demons to not push forward and set objectives and then they just died uh secondly they really benefited from auras stacking there's a reason that you now see double great and clean one in every competitive demons list because making things minus two toughness is fucking wild. And thirdly, a big thing that's helped them is uh, people having to relearn how to beat them. For a while there, it was like, just like the simulations when fighting demons, you knew exactly what the units were gonna do. You knew, because you know, they only had one viable build. Um, it was easy to, to, after one game, it was easy to predict what the monsters were gonna do and which ones you had to kill first. It was just very, very, now that we're seeing a mix-up in units uh, and a variety of units, we are starting to... It, it, it means that not every game against demons is going to be exactly the same. There's going to be some variance, some new ones. Still probably going to be Monster Mash, but there's still going to be some variance, some new ones there. And so people are having to relearn the formula for beating them. Uh, but overall, it's more the first two. Uh, stacking auras and lots of cheap shit. Lots of points decreases. The issue is that they don't seem to be able to, to win events. They have been consistently doing very well, and yet... Not just this weekend, but since the balance drop, they haven't won a tournament. And it's a, very, it's a very strange situation. Thousand Suns! My, my, my. So I have a little bit of insight into what Thousands are doing right now. Uh, they've got 26 players. They've got 74 wins. They've got 131 games played. They had six players go the distance. None of them won an event, but they have won four events since the balance data slate. They've got a 56% win rate and a 51% average win rate. <laughs> Basically, Magnus's, Magnus should be renamed to Atlas because he is carrying the entire faction on his shoulders. What you do is apparently you have, this, you have a... Uh, numerous sorcerers and what the sorcerers can do is they can use like cabal powers to basically uh sneak their way forward like they can like move multiple times and then if one sorceress can see you other units can basically shoot using his line of sight a little bit like a little bit but nowhere near but a little bit like expert bombardiers right one unit spots or daring recon one unit spots everything else get can shoot that unit right well, it helps a little bit. So basically what you do is you take a sorcerer, yeet them out, and then Magnus can see the unit that's hit, see the enemy units that are hidden behind the L-shaped ruins, and then Magnus blows them off the table. And you do that, and, and so can the Mutalix, Mutal, Mutalix Vortex Beats, whatever it's called. Yeah, it's basically Magnus is carrying the faction. Um, he's a demon Primarch after all, so I guess it's not the end of the world, but it does make for a very interesting point of weakness and Achilles heel. If your faction is being carried by one model, if someone is able to destroy that model, it means that the list starts struggling or falling apart. We then get Necrons. Necrons are probably Necrons are probably the top faction right now. Um there's every week there's some other faction that like takes the top spot. But realistically Necrons are probably the best faction right now. Um because they're consistently 
in the top three. 99 players makes them the most played faction this weekend. I'm the most played faction for a few weekends now. 276 wins out of 478 games played. That's a lot of games played. Uh, basically making up um, just over 10% of the player base. Uh, they had 24 players go the distance. That is tw that is 10% of the player base and uh, also 20, basically 25% 20, uh, a quarter of their players able to go uh, four and one or higher. Three tournaments were won by Necrons, giving them 17 tournament wins. There's just two, there, there are two detachments. There's Canoptec Court, which tends to every week have about a third of the players, and Hypercrypt Legion, which tends to have the vast majority of the players in it. Um, Canoptec Court this week, interestingly, actually had a higher win rate uh, than Hypercrypt Legion with 63% versus 56% and has a higher average of 57% versus 54%. But here's two things you need to... Well, here's one thing and how it's affecting Necrons in two ways. Artificially suppressed win rates, a.k.a. the mirror match. When two Necrons play against each other, one wins, one loses. So overall, the fact is drawn closer to 50% as a win rate. Mirror matches... When you have this many player numbers, mirror matches tend to add, uh, tend to suppress the win rate by four to five percent. So if we remove the mirror match from Necrons, you're actually looking at sixty, an overall win rate of sixty-two percent to sixty-three percent, which puts them higher than Space Wolves. If you look at Hive Crypt Legion, it may look. Like it is, you know, that Canoptic course is better, but there's so many more players playing it that the average win rate is probably suppressed by three to four to five percent. So Canoptic Court is very, very good. Don't get me wrong. And it's certainly viable with two tournament wins and 10 players going the distance. But Hybrid Legion is definitely having its win rate suppressed. And overall, as a faction, Necrons are definitely having the win rate suppressed. Big question is. Are Necrons in the same place that Eldar are in? They are. They 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 have won 17 events since the balance data slate. They are seeing ridiculously high numbers of players. I'd say no. I would agree with Warp Forge. The big difference between facing Eldar and Necrons right now is that Eldar can take two uh Catan-like objects. Two avatars. One of Kane, one of Yv Yin Khan or Yvrain. Necrons could take six. They can take three Transcendent Catan, one Void Dragon, one Deceiver, and one Nightbringer. And don't think the Deceiver is shit. He's not. He's actually very good. He has redeploys and all sorts of stuff. But Catan aren't the only issue. Wraiths are very, very durable. Uh, but Wraiths have a disadvantage where they can't really kill vehicles. I mean, I, you can cook old Wraiths with Chimeras and, and stuff. And the other issue is that um, the Hyper Grip Legion makes them very, very jumpy. I think GW should apply the same approach they did to uh, Eldar. Introduce a targeted nerf and wait. And then introduce another targeted nerf and wait. And if they do that, I think you'll see uh, Necrons settling into a good place like Eldar, where they get, you know, where they're consistently, you know, literally 49% win rate, one reek, 49% oh, since the balance data slate. I think the first target is going to be Catan. If you're a Necron player right now and you're expecting Catan to survive into the long term, I'd be very, I've got news for you. But it's not just Catan. There are a lot of good things in the Necron Codex. They are not... It's not just Catan. So don't expect Catan to go away and suddenly for Necrons to be fine. They are the top faction right now. They are doing very, very well. But they do have some hard counters... You know, like Votan, interestingly. As chat is saying, they have they still have to put the work in to get the wins. I've faced a lot of Catan. Whilst Necrons might be overall the top, there is someone that has eked them out this week, and it is the Space Wolves. Space Wolves. Uh, a bit of a surprise to be sure. Um maybe a bit of a welcome one. Maybe. 54 wins out of 88 games, six players going all the way, one player even managed to win a tournament, 61% win rate, which is a big leap over their 50% uh, win rate. I don't think Space Wolves will be up here again next week, um, bit of a blip. 
it's a Stormlands thing. Uh, it, it It's Stormlands. The big thing about uh, Space Wolves is right now, they're essentially, uh, I would describe them as a marine orc list. They're high pressure. They're going to run at you, and they're going to try and... Uh, it's called Wolf Jail, where basically they try and pin you in your deployment zone for multiple turns so that... Um, and so all the wolves are expected to die, but uh, they're just scoring everything. And then by the time you've blasted through them, you can't. Uh, you can't catch up on points. Basically like a goth pressure list. Here's the thing with pressure lists. People adapt to them. And they, they adapt to them fairly quickly. And also there's certain factions which it's fucking suicide to do it against. You want to do wolf jail against a guard army? They'll go through every single Thunderwolf cavalry you have in a turn without breaking a sweat. You line up, if you get your 18 fucking Thunderwolves and yeet them in front of a guard army, you're going to hit a bunch of guardsmen who are then going to basically, you know, fall back from you. Or you're just going to murder them all. And then they're going to uh, just blast you off the table with all of, with all the guns. So um, it's gonna, then it's going to come down to how many Thorp saves you can make. Because they're not that tough. They're like T4 or T5. They're not that tough. Um, so it is it is good, but uh, and it's a tactic that has been seeing increasing success. Um, but I I suspect that uh, it's a pressure list and and pressure lists they they spike and then they start going down. So we'll we'll, we'll keep an eye on this. But overall, that just about covers it. Is it fun at a casual level? Uh, that's probably a different question. But uh, as, as a competitive level, 10th edition, certainly fun. And I've come away, I've just been to America and played the shit out. I played nine competitive games of 40k and come away and thought, well, yeah, I need a, I need a, a week or two off, but I'm looking forward to playing my next game of 40k. That's definitely something that, uh, that's definitely something that is, deserves a recognition. Last thing to edge before I go, thank you to everyone um, that came up to me at Adepticon and said hi and got selfies. It was incredible. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit more into this um, in, some of the, in the other Adepticon streams, but uh, it was amazing to meet so many people from the channel and um, it was quite humbling to have uh, you know so many people come up and, and just say nice things and, and say, a, say hello. So um, apart from that one guy in the airport who I definitely, I fucked up that interaction, <laughs> failed as a human being in that interaction, Thank you to all of you, and uh, I said, well, thank you to that guy as well. But you know, um, thank you to all of you, and I hope that, um, yeah, I hope, I hope that you, uh, um, I hope that you enjoyed tonight's stream. That's all for now. Thank you for watching. Of course, as always, see you guys next time. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patrons. You guys are amazing. Truly the lifeblood of the channel. I could not do Mordian glory full time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patreons these are the war masters the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty to a heartfelt thank you to alex dengal bon bon vert mad larkin marcus roberts mark panconi rj scorpion swordfish trombone 
Try Again Bragg, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, and August Barney. Seriously, guys, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your support is incredible, and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much. That's all for now. Hope you've all enjoyed today's video, and of course, as always, see you guys next time. <laughs>